Hello and welcome to Champaign Public Library for tonight's Foraging for Fun with Bly Widmer. My name is Trisha Duzan and I'm the Adult Services Manager here at the library and we're bringing this program as part of the Parable CU collaboration that's happening um, in conjunction with Cranert Center for the Performing Arts. Um, this includes community read, discussions, and it will be culminating with the uh, Octavia E. Butler Parables of the Sower and Opera by Toshi Reagan and Bernice Johnson at the Cranert Center in February 2022. So be sure to check that out at cranertcenter.com. And before I get started here, I just want to let you know that you can use the chat for questions and we'll address those uh, later on in the event. And if you want to speak, just raise your hand um, by using the raise your hand feature. Um, Bly comes to us as the senior instrument maintenance instructor at Exelon's Clinton Power Station. He's a graduate of the 2020 Exelon Emerging Leaders course, station innovation ambassador, and two-time speaker at the conference on nuclear training and education. He spends his free time foraging around the local area, working on electronics and dabbling in music. Thank you, Bly, for joining us tonight, and I'll let you get started. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me, and thank you to all of you for joining us. Uh, welcome to Foraging for Fun. I am your host, Bly Widmar, and today we're going to be talking about all the forest promises and more. So uh, I'm going to basically be talking to you about some of the very basics of foraging. Now, before I do get too deep into, you know, all the excitement that we have here, I got to start with safety and uh, this very brief disclaimer here. You are responsible for your own health and safety. Um, th this is paramount when it comes to foraging. I don't want anyone uh, out there getting sick based off of something that they have picked and misidentified. So I'm not going to spend this presentation telling you how necessarily to positively identify certain species. Instead, I'm going to go over some very basic ideas um, and methods of ensuring that you're finding something that's edible and uh, basically using useful resources that you could find at your local library, like a book or something. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure that nobody nobody takes this as more than reference. Uh, please do not use anything I say directly in here as your de facto guide to identifying any wild plants, animals, or fungi. This is, after all, based off Parable of the Sower, where somebody heroically finds uh, how to eat and survive in the world with prior knowledge. Uh, we don't want to turn this into something bad like Into the Wild, where the main character eats some poison berries and dies. I think. I've actually never read the book or seen the movie, but I'm pretty sure that's what happens. Anyway, with that, uh, I want to start with the three rules of foraging. So I've kind of narrowed it down to my three rules. You'll hear a lot of rule, different rules, but they kind of focus around this same ideology. Uh, the first one you should consider everything poisonous until proven otherwise. And the reason that I say that it sounds almost counterintuitive, we're talking about food and finding edible things. And I start by saying, no, you, you gotta consider it poisonous, but that's a important way of thinking to make sure that you don't eat something that is poisonous. If you treat everything with the respect and dignity like it's poisonous, then you're going to avoid eating something poisonous once you've proven it otherwise. Um, second thing, only pick what's recognizable and above store quality. So there are a lot of edible things out there. There are things you can turn into tea. There are mushrooms you can turn into tea, vines, thistles, you can turn into soup. And while they are indeed edible, they're not necessarily good. Uh, at the end of the day, a portobello mushroom is good. Like it, it's really good. A lot of people think that the butt mushrooms and portobellos aren't good, but it's because it's what they're used to seeing and they want something more exciting, but there's nothing exciting about eating something that's going to hurt you like a poisonous mushroom. And finally, confirm your finding through three or more sources. I should note independent sources there, but um, it's what I like to use is the Autobahn field guides, typically when I'm identifying plants or mushrooms. Uh, then I have an app that I can identify them in as well to help me narrow it down in a more interactive fashion. And then the third option is typically online. Um, and that could be something like a video or a website or a blog. 
that's just helping me confirm through you know multiple resources and links that I'm not actually eating something that's going to be poisonous. But we'll talk about that more here in a little bit. Uh, I'd like to get into a little bit more detail about our first rule, everything is poisonous until proven otherwise. So in front of you, you see a pile of chanterelle mushrooms, or are they? They could also be deadly jack-o'-lantern mushrooms, and you don't know that for darn sure. It's a 50-50 shot, and that's not a shot worth taking. Now, we're going to talk about some of these methods, but uh, and they vary to each person, but you want to make sure that your methods do vary. Um, and it's important that you use them prior to consumption because you don't want to eat something poisonous. Uh, remember that conditions do change. Just because one spot yielded edible chanterelles one year doesn't mean that the next year they're going to do the same thing. They probably will, but you don't want to take a chance and just assume that the orange mushroom that popped out of the earth in a cluster is all of a sudden edible because chanterelles were there previously. You want to make sure you also know your area. Uh, you, don't, you don't want to be eating anything that was in like a you know lead dumping ground or old mining operation. You want to make sure that you're eating something from safe earth. Now, I'm not expecting that you're going to be running out there with like a soil sampler and sending it off to a lab for analysis, but you know a little bit of common sense will run you a long way. If there's like a whole bunch of like dead animals around where you're at, maybe the soil isn't great. Maybe the dead animals are causing the soil to get bad. I just you know make sure you know your area. Um, and it is very valuable to refresh your knowledge. Uh, I've been doing this for a couple of years now, and I still don't trust me fully. I really like to reference other books, other literature, other apps, and make darn sure that what I'm actually finding is indeed still edible. There could be new information out there. There could be some new subvariety that was discovered. It's incredibly unlikely, but your old knowledge isn't something you should continue to bet on, especially when you're potentially putting your life on the line, identifying something poisonous and not poisonous. And with that, there's this phrase, there are old mushroom hunters and there are bold mushroom hunters, but there are no old, bold mushroom hunters. Uh, that is to say that people who are bold mushroom hunters typically have no regard for their health and safety and they perish early. Uh, in all seriousness, I've never met a old and bold mushroom hunter. Is that because they accidentally eradicated themselves? I don't know. Um, the odds of it though is because most people who are actually out foraging um, and do this stuff seriously are concerned about their health and safety. There are plenty of articles out there about people who just eaten a random mushroom they found and it didn't turn out well. So uh, I, I don't imagine too many of them are out with apps and Autobahn guides looking at this stuff. But anyway, that rolls us into our second rule. Next bit here, only pick what's recognizable and above store quality. So you wanna make sure that you're not running that 50-50 shot of poison versus delicious or worse, poisoned versus bland. There are a lot of mushrooms, for example, or even weeds, um, thistles, things that are just marked as edible. Or if you ask me even below edible, you can make it into a tea. Um, if you can make it into a tea, it just means that it's not poisonous. Um, and it has some flavor that isn't that of water. It's not worth it for something bland and it's not worth it for something amazing. So this is the other flip side. I've heard people say like, oh, well, this could be a poisonous bullet, or it could be this really good one. And it's just, it's not worth it. Even if it's, and I, I do wanna sideline this, even if it's just like the upset stomach version of poison, not the you're going to die or hallucinogenic type poison, um, it's, it's not worth taking the chance. It's just not. You wanna know before you pick. And if you're picking them for studying, then you wanna make sure that you bag this stuff separately. Now, again, whether this be fruit, uh, vegetation, uh, or a mushroom, Make sure that you're keeping this stuff separate from others so that way it doesn't get mixed up. And it's important that you are willing to go and pick some of this stuff and bring it home for study. Uh, depending on how you want to go about you know, confirming the idea of a mushroom, you can run a spore print. You could look at these spores underneath a microscope if you happen to have one of those sitting around. You can also do chemical analysis. Those can all be found in some books that we'll discuss a little bit later. Also, Please don't take any more than you need if you're just IDing them, especially. Um, don't take more than you need anyway. There's something called the plight of the commons that we'll discuss later, but 
you only need a couple of them to really get a positive ID. Uh, and I do see your question about the app. I will get to that on what I think is the next slide. Um, I do always throw this reminder out. Portobello's are edible and good. So are the little button mushrooms, so are the white ones. I know that's something common that you can get from a store. And part of the idea of going out and picking your own food is the excitement that you found this thing, that it came from nature, that it doesn't have uh, preservatives, may not have been grown in you know, a, a hostile type environment. But at the end of the day, that stuff is still good quality food and it does taste good. And even if you want something more than that, like Worcester mushrooms, king trumpets, shiitakes, et cetera, you can find that at a lot of markets. Um, I know that both of the Asian markets that I've visited in Champagne, and I know that there's several more than just the two. Um, I'm blanking on the name of one of them. It's over by Golden Harbor. But anywho, they have a lot of varieties of mushrooms, including cream trumpet oyster shiitake, a bunch of the little ones that I like to put in my ramen. So you can get them from a store. And if that doesn't suit your fancy, you can also find them from local mushroom growers. I could not find the business card for the life of me, but I happen to know that the market at uh, Lincoln Square Mall, every other week or something like that, there is, hey, look at that, Flyway Family Farm, that's the one, thank you. So yes, you can, <laughs> you can visit them and they do grow mushrooms. So another wonderful source. Uh, I got some chestnut mushrooms for them, they were great. Finally, the three or more sources. So. For mushroom guide, uh, for mushrooms, I like to use the Audubon field guide. I would show you my copy of it if I could have found it. I'm pretty sure it's in the back of my car and I forgot to look there until this thing started. Um, applications, so I use a phone app. I recommend purchased ones. The reason that I recommend purchased ones are because they're actually, in my mind, better. Someone is paid and therefore incentivized to give you some of the best possible product. Um, I, they also generally have better pictures, better IDing tools. The free ones aren't bad, but I wouldn't rely on them as much. Also, don't ever use the ones that rely on just taking a picture. I'm a fan of what's known as Shroomify. And the reason I'm a fan of that one is because when you use it, it actually goes through and step-by-step -step IDs it. So you can pick the type of mushroom structure. You can pick the colors. You can pick uh, how the... Um, gills attached to the stem, a lot of stuff that helps narrow it down to a certain variety. And the final one is an online resource of some sort. Um, videos, websites, blogs, there's a lot of information that can be found online that may not have been in the app or in the field guide. And an example that I give is the field guide that I was using didn't talk about any inedible or poisonous varieties of bleats. Now, when I looked on my app, it had a couple, but it didn't get into any of them that were poisonous either. When I got online, I found a whole blog dedicated to bleats, and it started talking about some of them that are actually poisonous depending on their growth conditions. So that was one where right off the bat I knew, oh, if I had only gone off of those two, I wouldn't have found this extra piece of information. It's also important to help you break your confirmation bias. You want to be excited about the mushroom you found. You really want it to be edible, but it's just not worth the risk. So we've got our book, we've got our Shroomify app, and we've got, you know, Ask Jeeves or Yahoo Answers or whatever you end up using. And as far as other options go, you could join something like an outdoor club or a group that does wild foraging, mushroom hunting, or just, you know, regular old hunting and salespeople. So Wild harvest salesmen and women do exist. There are people who go out and hunt for um, what's known as uh, hen of the woods or matake. And basically they will find them, positively identify them, and they will sell them to restaurants. Usually you'll find them as part of your local mushroom foraging groups. And another nice part about them is usually they're licensed of some sort and have a card that basically says, yep, I'm able to confirm mushrooms with 100% you know, accuracy. Now, I'm going to get into a couple of them here that are recognizable and edible in this area. So I'm going to hit on what I call my top five. And these are ones that you can find locally and that I've all found locally. They're all really, really good, have a lot of good recipes. And most importantly, none of them are morels. 
Now, I know everyone gets really excited about the idea of morels. And trust me, I love a good morel. However, I'm usually not out hunting them because uh, I consider that the every man's huntable mushroom. Everyone's going to be out there hunting for them, looking for them. You're going to find the people who are like vicious about their areas. And if they see you walking in them, they'll come over and accost you and say, this is my area. And it's a public park and they're lying to you. There is no their area on a public park. However, uh, you typically don't see too many people out mushroom hunting in lion's mane season. Uh, but there was other hunting going on at that time, and we'll talk about that safety here in a second. So the first one I do have on the screen is the lion's mane mushroom. Um, this is actually one that I just found recently, first time I've ever found it in the wild, and I was incredibly excited about it. Now, from my memory, lion's mane mushrooms did not have any poisonous lookalikes. However, I still had to do all that research to myself to prove that the mushroom I was about to eat was indeed edible. Um, and this one's very recognizable because it's basically, for lack of a better term, got a bunch of short tentacles on it. And it's usually high up in a tree and it just kind of sits there in the same way that bricks don't. And uh, yeah, you can cut it off and then pull it apart, cook it, knead it. I also dried some of it. Um, I will say, Another note, there's a lot of medicinal purposes behind a lot of mushrooms that we hear from people. I'm not gonna talk about any of those. You can research those and determine if that is a benefit or not to yourself at a later date and time. But yeah, lion's mane, very good. It's almost got a little bit of a seafood, like crab type taste to it and a really neat texture. And those little tendrils get uh, really crispy when you fry them up in butter. So these ones you'll typically find, like I said, up in a tree or on maybe a dead stump somewhere or a dying stump. And yeah, they're, they're pretty high up and pretty recognizable. Next one, we've got the chicken of the woods. So this is a really recognizable, really good one that you'll sometimes see family members say, oh, I found this thing rolling on my tree and I kicked it off. Uh, they just kicked like a lot of good food off of their tree. Now, this asterisk that I have next to chicken of the woods is because if you get it off of a pine tree or another conifer, it could be... Um, I forget the word. Basically, it, it could give you an upset stomach. Um, it's not going to be lethal or anything, but it's important that you make sure that you're not getting it off of a pine tree. Uh, you can usually tell by the bark or just the way that it is. Um, I recommend it's kind of that double-edged sword now if you have to know a little bit about trees to know a little bit about mushrooms. Um, but field guides should hopefully help explain some of that or at least applications or online sources. But yeah, it's a very easy mushroom to pick. You just cut it off. Uh, it's very easy to clean. It's a polypore type, so it doesn't have a bunch of gills underneath that are going to trap water. So very easy to brush the, um, the like dust off of it. The only thing that you got to be wary of is the bugs that like to hide out and make it its home. So every time I bring them home, I usually process them in this little bucket that I have that uh, helps keep all the bugs off of my kitchen counter and away from my plants. Um, yeah, that's the basics on chicken of the woods. You can fry those up real good. Um, I've made chicken of the woods poor boys. Delicious. I recommend them. Um, let's see. Do I recommend vinegar? I Yes, vinegar is great for cooking. Uh, anything, a little bit of acidity really helps bring out the flavors. I don't know if that was the exact question, but... I didn't state that very well. Uh, to soak it in vinegar to get the bugs out, is that... Oh, oh, no, I wouldn't recommend that at all. Uh, you could really? do that okay. if you wanted. So if you're going to like pickle them, yes, pickled mushrooms. I've done pickled chanterelles. They're absolutely amazing. Um, okay. My recommendation is like it's, it's a dry mushroom. So depending on how you're going to cook it, you can just basically pull it apart. You're going to have to to get a good clean and make sure that nothing grew inside of it. Um, sometimes they'll grow around leaves. And so you'll actually have like a leaf inside of your mushroom. So if you just pull them apart, you'll be able to get all the bugs out of them pretty easy. And again, it's not like the thing's just creepy crawling with bugs. Usually it's like five or six beetles, a couple like fly type things, and maybe a few larvae of some sort, um, at least from my experience. You know, your mileage may vary. So next one I got here is hen of the woods. Uh, this is another one that you'll hear people say, yeah, I just saw this weird rock looking mushroom in my garden and I stomped it a whole bunch. And Again, I get it. They, you know, it's an unfamiliar looking mushroom, but this is my favorite mushroom by far. Uh, it's really easy to pick. It's really easy to dry. I'll get this thing down to two different types of dry. There's like the leather dry where it's still got a little bit of flex to it, but it's not bone dry. And then there's like the bone dry. 
Uh, you've taken everything out of it. You can just snap it really easy. You can make powder out of it at that point. We'll talk about that here in a bit. But uh, Hen of the Woods reconstitutes really well. Hen of the Woods is typically found around, again, dying or dead oak trees. Um, the, they can get really big or you can find them really small and you'll find them in varying shapes and sizes. Now, I didn't put an asterisk next to this one. It does have a lookalike. And that lookalike is the black staining polypore, which is not going to kill you. I mean, it doesn't have any good flavors, but that's the only thing that looks even remotely similar to this. And again, if you check three different sources, you ought to be able to, uh, you know, to sit, uh, figure out which one you've got. And I will also note that a hen of the woods has a really recognizable, strong mushroomy smell where the black staining polypore does not. And Abby, congratulations on finding some. Uh, I hope you make a trip back at some point to grab them, assuming it's like safe to grab it. We'll talk about those rules here in a little bit. Next one's going to be dryad saddles. Now, these ones I was really happy with. They grew on a tree on my neighbor's property right across the street from me. They would always bloom early. Um, the reason they would bloom early is because the tree they were growing on was not fully dead. So when the tree started to blossom, they started kickstarting and growing at that point. Um, the only downside to that is that because of uh, some new zoning and sidewalk repairs that are occurring, which I'm all for, you know, good condition sidewalks. I don't want people tripping and I want them to be accessible to everybody. However, they did cut down that tree. So I have now lost my source of dryad saddles that was immediately across the street from me. But when they're young like this and they are this, uh, like basically the pores haven't opened up a bunch, they are really, really good. They've got a very slight flavor of like, uh, lemon and watermelon rind, which I know may not sound like the most appealing flavor, but you cook them up with a little bit of butter, some pepper, maybe a little splash of vinegar, and you've got yourself a nice little feast. Um, again, fairly recognizable pattern on them. And when you find them this young, there's not any poisonous lookalikes. Uh, again, please note that through any guides or online sources, your mileage may vary by region. And last but not least, bullets. Um, I love finding these ones. They're very easy to recognize because they've got a little spongy side on the bottom. So what we're used to seeing from most mushrooms is something that is gilled. However, these have a sponge type uh, bottom. When you uh, squeeze them a little bit, depending on like how much squish they have, kind of tells you how fresh they are. Now that's typical of a lot of mushrooms, but these ones in particular, because as they start to spore, they get a lot squishier. Um, this particular variety here is the birch bleat. Very good, um, named so because it's typically found around birch trees, but I've also found them around oaks. Um, there's a lot of different sub varieties of these. And again, I make the little comment there that you need to be careful because field guides will tell you, yeah, I mean, you probably found one that's good. And an app may tell you, yeah, it's probably good. And then you'll find a book online that references a whole bunch of sub varieties you've never heard of. And you'll find out that, oh, one of these isn't good. Um, another thing to note on bolites, you'll hear rules of thumb where people will say, oh, if you like push into it with your thumb and it bruises, excuse me, bruises blue, it's poisonous. Uh, that's not always true. There is a variety that is poisonous and bl uh, bruises blue the moment you touch it or you cut into it, but there's also a variety that is not. So anytime you hear a rule of thumb with a mushroom, they say, oh, you can always eat ones that grow in this time of year, or always eat ones that grow on a tree, or that always have this shape to them. They are lying. Do not rely off of a rule of thumb. Um, there are a lot of infamous stories out there about people who thought like, if you stirred it with a silver spoon and they didn't turn black, then it was edible. And it turns out this one lady was slowly killing off her liver and kidneys because she was eating poisonous mushrooms because she was fed bad information. Don't feed yourself bad information. Feed yourself good mushrooms. Uh, let's move into plants now. So I have a couple examples of some edible plants that I typically find around my area. Um, the one that I love to talk about is garlic mustard. So this is an invasive plant species. Uh, this is one that should not be spread. It needs to be uh, basically killed any chance that you can without being too disruptive to local wildlife and uh, the habitat that it's in. But yeah, it's invasive. We don't want to spread the seeds of it. So my thought with like a lot of invasive species of fish is if you can find a way to make it delicious, then you can incentivize people to basically <laughs> get rid of it. 
Now, garlic mustard does not have a very strong flavor, but the young leaves at the top do have a slight garlicky and mustardy flavor. So I have been known while I'm out in the woods doing some of my foraging to pick the pieces off of them and then stomp the ever-living daylights out of the remainder of the plant and uproot it and then use those in some of my cooking. Uh, other options, we've got things like the blackberries. So of course we know blackberries are edible. We see them in stores all the time. There are the edible varieties out there. Again, little, I uh, forgot to put the asterisk on that one, but like anything, you wanna make darn sure that you are indeed picking a blackberry. Not that a mulberry is gonna make you sick necessarily, but you also wanna make sure that you're properly cleaning these things out. Um, you know, you don't want a bunch of little bugs or bacteria sitting in there. There's the wild onions or wild garlic, depending on what you wanna call them. Uh, I'm a big fan of those because they grow in my lawn and I see them grow in a lot of other lawns that I happen to walk through. I'll just snip some up and I like to dry it and then just use it as a mild garlicky and oniony season. And nuts. I love talking about these wild nuts because there's so many places that just have nut trees and no one ever does anything with the nuts except the squirrels who like to throw the husks at you while you're sitting hanging out below. So uh, pecans, walnuts, acorns, yes, acorns are edible. Uh, they have a lot of tannins in them, so they're not very uh, tasty. There's methods of making them edible. Again, you can read about that and find out if you're interested. But uh, pecans and walnuts are my favorite ones to talk about because we have found, like, there's, uh, I think it's by Japan House. You know, don't go storming Japan House trying to find all their pecans and walnuts, but they have black walnut trees out there and they've got pecan trees. So uh, I've, you know, been able to pick a couple up and just smash some open and enjoy myself a fresh pecan. Now, the other note on those, um, again, with anything, make sure that you are picking a healthy piece of fruit. Oh, pawpaws in your Japan house? I gotta go check that out. Pawpaws, I didn't even put those on there, but they're like the Osage banana, they're delicious. Uh, you'll have to fight the squirrels for them. So yeah, a lot of great areas around here that have just fruit and nuts falling to the ground that no one does anything with because they just don't know any better. So definitely worth checking out there. Uh, edible animals, pretty much all of them uh, with a couple, several asterisks on there. Some of them are already illegal to eat. So uh, please do not shoot any bald eagles and try to eat those. They're probably not tasty. Never tried one, but I don't want to take that risk. Also bald eagles are just kind of pretty and I don't want to mess with their nests. And some have sustained risk involved and require special care when butchering or cooking. Again, Eeyore here, eat at your own risk. So rabbits are a prime example of that. Some of them have a bloodborne disease that uh, if it gets into your blood can make you very sick. You don't want that. Uh, deer, squirrel, and frogs are among some of my favorite. Uh, frogs are uh, not really in season right now. I love just describing frogs like that. But you can go out, uh, I think the term we use is gigging. And I'll, uh, they've got like a little fork thing you can use to poke at them. Um, I consider that slightly less humane. I like to use a slingshot. Uh, deer, of course you know, rifle hunting. Well, I'm sorry, I'm from Missouri. You can rifle hunt in Missouri. You cannot here in Illinois. So bow hunting um, and squirrels. But the big note with the hunting, the real hunting here of animals is, of course, you got to check your state and local regulations and laws. There are seasons for this stuff. They require hunter safety course and ID. And most importantly, you've got to remember some of these seasons. Because if you're out, say, mushroom hunting or berry hunting or picking up wild pawpaws in a time of year when, say, deer are out and about and people are allowed to hunt them, um, you might have a really bad time if you're wearing a brown jacket. So please, 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 please pay attention to any hunting that is occurring in an area that you are foraging in or especially hunting. Um, I'm a big advocate for wearing blaze orange whenever you're out foraging. Uh, I know it looks goofy as heck, and there may not be hunting going on in the season, but blaze orange means that you're very identifiable, which you should be willing to want to be if you're trying to hide while you're foraging. You're either trespassing or breaking a law, or you're trying to keep it a secret, and come on, it's nature. Let's share this stuff. Um, so yeah, blaze orange. That, and if something should happen to you, you're a lot easier to spot if you're, like, you know, falling down a creek and unconscious or something. Uh, so a couple recipes and preservation basics. So let's say that you've found some mushrooms. Um, there's a couple different options with them. One, you can dry them. Now how you dry them is kind of up to you. Some will recommend just putting them on like a cookie dry or a cooling rack and setting them on top of a fan. And the fan just naturally over time gets it down to that leathery consistency. 
that works, depending on the type of mushroom you're using. Um, if I'm going to dry something, it's usually going to be hen of the woods. And usually I'm just going to do it in the dehydrator for speed at a lower temperature because you don't want to dehydrate it too quickly to where it dries out the outside and the inside's left soggy. So plus sides of drying, it's great for making spices. You can grind it up really easily. Uh, it also lasts a lot longer. Downside to that is if you reconstitute it, it's not going to be like you just picked it. Unless you've done Hint of the Woods, that reconstitutes really well. Uh, you also risk mold if not properly dried. Ask me how I lost a, like several pounds of dried chicken of the woods. Yeah, that was how. Uh, there's also the cooking and freezing method where you just cook it in a cast iron skillet. Uh, some of them will recommend a little bit of oil. Some will recommend you not. It's kind of up to you and the variety and how you want to cook it. But basically, you're just knocking the water out of it, um, getting it cooked to kill any you know bacteria or anything on it. Uh, by the way, also make sure you wash your mushrooms. Some people will swear you don't have to wash your mushrooms. Uh, I recommend it because if you do not, you may get a whole bunch of dirt in your mushrooms and then just waste several pounds of chanterelle mushrooms. Also ask me how I know that one. Uh, but yeah, then once you've cooked it like that, you can pop it in a freezer bag, stick it in your freezer, and it lasts for a couple months. You can consider that an upside or a downside. Uh, finally, my favorite option is just cooking and eating it immediately. You get the best flavor and texture, and you get immediate satisfaction from your hunt. I'm pretty big on keeping around steaks during chanterelle season because once I find them, you bet I get home, pop a uh, steak in the sous vide, get it all heated up, and then blitz it over to the fire, and then bam, I've got fresh, delicious, juicy steak, and I've got mushrooms. It's it, it, There's nothing better in the world. Um, next up, some recipe ideas. So ketchups. Now, I didn't think to grab a link to it, but if y'all were to look up mushroom ketchup on YouTube, I'm pretty sure the first video that's going to pop up is a James Townsend and Son video on how to make mushroom ketchup. So that is an 18th century recipe. 18th century, 1700s? Yeah, that's it. 18th century recipe. Um, and it's really, really good. You can make it with store-bought mushrooms. You can make it with wild mushrooms. I typically make it with wild mushrooms until I run out of it and there's nothing in season. Then I go make it store-bought stuff. But you get a really good liquid seasoning that's great on like roasts. Um, and then once you take that, uh, you basically get the spice stuff out of it as well, well once you dry it. And then you can grind that up and make a powder. And my advocation for that powder is it's basically vegan Worcestershire sauce, Worcestershire sauce, however you want to pronounce it. But yeah, um, it's amazing. Gives it good umami. Um, you can do soups and stews with it. Of course, a nice cream of mushroom soup is a great way to use those frozen mushrooms. Uh, you can also use dried ones. And um, there's a re recipe by Adam Ragusia that you can find that has uh, how to use the dried ones and then grind them up and not risk the leathery texture. And of course, wild vegetable soup. Uh, been there, done that. I remember a hike once upon a time where my dad was picking wild vegetables and used them to thicken and enhance his stew. Uh, there's desserts. Blackberry dumplings are a great way to use a lot of the blackberries that you've found. Uh, of course, there's tons of other desserts. I mean, uh, on a camp out once upon a time, we made apple Plains, apple frit, uh, there's some sort of 17th century or 18th century apple pie used with apples that we had picked while we were out and about. And there's also beverages. So whether that be teas, cocktails, uh, infusions into some sort of like summer, you know, uh, sparkly fancy water thing that you make. Um, I have done, I, I've picked black cherries before. So the nuclear power plant that I work at had a black cherry tree. And I was able to pick from that black cherry tree, uh, process the black cherries, which was one of the biggest pains in the butts. I'm telling you, the, the cherry meat to nut ratio is terrible. It is like 90% seed and you can't eat the seed or have the seed in the final product. So I had to pit these cherries and basically I just ended up with a slurry of cherry goo. But I was able to use that. Um, mixed it with some adult beverage, let it sit and age for a while. And then eventually I had what I called nuclear cherry moonshine, which is kind of cool, especially when you drink it out of a uranium glass. Uh, um, oh, I'm blanking on the word glass. Let's just go with glass, a glass glass. Um, now we're going to move on to some basic safety tips. So 
We talked a little bit earlier about being aware of the seasons, making sure that you're not running into other hunters and wearing orange. Um, when I talk about other hunters, that could be actually, you know, like people with bows and arrows out hunting deer, or it could be other mushroom hunters who are very, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, protective of their area. I don't think that there's ever going to be too many violent altercations over uh, mushrooms, but you never know. If you're uh, ending up in a point where you're trespassing, it just might, so please be careful of that. Uh, please do not disrupt any wildlife. Be careful of that. So seed transfer is a big one. Um, you don't want to accidentally like spread a bunch of seeds, like say, you know, garlic mustard seeds. I'm pretty big on being careful about those burrs, you know, the ones that just get stuck on everything because A, I don't like picking them out of my clothes and B, I don't want to spread those seeds and make them grow more places. I don't like them. I want them as few places as possible. You don't want to destroy any habitats. So, you know, you're not accidentally like kicking over birds nests or anything. And uh, I said steams, I definitely meant to say streams, but a big one that people seem to forget about is streams and uh, water sources, rivers, you know, whatever. Because a lot of people, they go out in nature, they feel in harmony, they wanna like pick up a bunch of rocks and stack them and make these really pretty photo ops. And it turns out you're just kind of disrupting a whole bunch of natural habitats, especially for crawfish. And it's pretty uncool of you. So don't do that and uh, don't just go throwing rocks around. And also, don't just hunt for crawfish. There are better ways to get those than your local stream. Uh, big emphasis on no trespassing. So I do want to tie this back to the whole blaze orange discussion. If you're wearing blaze orange, you are clearly being safe-minded and you want people to notice you. Now, this is the, oh, I know someone who knew someone type story here. But once upon a time, I have a friend who has a friend who was out hunting for mushrooms, was wearing blaze orange, accidentally started trespassing on somebody's property. The individual saw them, approached them, said, hey, you're on my property. You're taking my mushrooms. I don't much appreciate that out here. And the guy says, oh, I'm very sorry. I didn't mean to. And the guy goes, eh, I, you know what? I, I, I appreciate it. You know, they were cordial about it. And part of it, he reckoned, was he was wearing blaze orange. He's not like trying to sneak around someone's property and not be noticed. So it led to just a casual discussion. Okay, here's the boundaries. Hey, you know, you're welcome to come back out here and hunt. Just let me know uh, and don't take my morels. You can look for other stuff. Uh, and finally, there's leave no trace principles. So this is just good stewardship of the environment. Please make sure you're not leaving any traces. You're not like marking on trees, cutting into things with your knife to identify a tree species or mark it for later. You want to leave nature the way you found it or better if at all possible. Um, I like to hike with a trash bag so I can pick up trash. And that rolls nicely into this environmental stewardship piece. How are you giving back to nature from all of this? Um, you have just stolen from nature some of its precious seed. Now, don't get me wrong, a lot of it would probably just rot and die. Uh, if you pick it off public prairies, you know, there may be a chance that they're just pruning some of that. But what are you helping do for the land? I mean, honestly, picking up a bunch of black walnuts around your pan house doesn't hurt me any because it means less black walnuts I'm stepping on when I'm out there uh, sword fighting on the weekends. Uh, I also recommend how are you preserving this for future generations? Uh, I'm a forager, so you bet whenever the uh, Muhammad Park District said, hey, we want to raise taxes a little bit so that way we can help with our districting, I said, yeah, I'm okay with that. Um, again, picking up trash, uh, making sure that you're using a little thing, they have this brush out where I like to walk, that you can make sure you're not spreading any seeds. And uh, I like to mention this, the beware, the tragedy of the commons. So tragedy of the commons is basically saying that too many people being self-interested will end up ruining their future sustainability. And a perfect example of this was around, oh, I forget what big village it was in Europe, but basically for like a mile and a half around the village, there was no wood. You couldn't just go grab wood to build your fire because everyone just went out and said, well, I need wood. I'm going to cut down this tree. They didn't think, well, maybe grow other trees in its place. They didn't think, well, maybe I'll go find dead wood a little bit further out. Everyone just kept going for what was immediately accessible and necessary. And they ended up robbing from themselves and all their neighbors because they were all too focused on you know, just themselves and the easy route. And this is something that can easily happen with nature. I think we've all heard the story of the giving tree where people took too much from it and finally died. Um, 
I haven't personally seen it as much around here. And I think that can owe that to some great park districting that we have and the, you know, taxpayer dollars going to good use, but it's something to be wary about. If you're seeing everybody just out picking, you know, blackberries out in uh, say the Muhammad uh, Buffalo trace preserve, well, there comes a point where all the blackberries are picked by the trail. People start going off trail. They might be kicking over rabbit's nests or something. And my final note here is the cycle of waste. Uh, if you do pick something, please make sure you're eating it or finding a way to consume it or let others consume it. Uh, prime example, if you went and picked a bunch of blackberries, uh, cleaned them, washed them, blanched them, put them in a bag, stuck them in your freezer, and then forgot about them for two years. And then you took it out and went, oh, these are freezer burned. And then you just throw them away. And then eventually your trash gets picked up and that biological matter ends up in a landfill and then it gets compressed. And then as it starts to rot, it produces methane, which starts to rise. And then that becomes something that's a little bit of a greenhouse gas as well as a potential fire hazard. And all that just because you went and picked something that probably would have been eaten by a raccoon at some point and had far less of an impact on the environment in that time. So please, again, it, it's really tempting to want to just grab everything you can while you're out there. But uh, you, you definitely want to give it a chance to, you know, just take what you need. Uh, I will answer this question. Does picking mushrooms prevent them from spreading spores that they would have otherwise spread? And is that bad? So picking them can help with that. Um, I don't want you thinking that, like, there's kind of this myth that people say, oh, well, I'm just walking around with them in a bag here. It's going to spread spores. Uh, you're using a plastic trash bag, sir. There's no way that the spores are getting out of that thing, at least not in sufficient quantity. Um, the sporing cycle starts to vary on a mushroom. Some of them, when they get to the point that they will spore, means that they are now reduced in edibility. Prime example is the puffball mushroom. If you cut that open and see it starting to turn green, that means it's ready to start sporing, which means it is starting to spoil from an edibility perspective and you cannot eat it. So basically, uh, it, it varies. Um, there is kind of this old adage of only pick uh, up to two thirds of what you find. Um, some of it is for leaving it for other mushroom hunters. Some of it's for trying to pace yourself and make sure that you're not taking more than you need. And of course you're leaving some of it there for the environment to absorb it or for it to spread its spore. Um, again, you, you will spread its spore or its mycelium somewhat by picking it and moving it, but it's, in my opinion, it's not in sufficient quantities. And I like to think that you should just leave some stuff. It's kind of a, a piece with nature that I like to have. And yes, I do recommend a, uh, a, a bag with the uh, uh, mesh in it. Anyway, that pretty much ends this. I didn't put a slide that says the end questions. So with that, I will say the end uh, questions, other questions. And also, if you would prefer that you want to ask the question verbally, um, just raise your hand or let type in the chat box and I can unmute you. Happy to do that. Are some months better than others for seasonality? Absolutely. Um, the Shroomify Mushroom app, which again, I, I forget how much it was on the App Store. It's on Android. I don't know if it's on iOS. It has stuff by seasons, by region as well. Region is incredibly important, as is season. Um, I'm opening the app now. I'm not just being rude and getting on my phone. Um, at the front menu, you have like November's common fungi. So it shows you all the stuff that's available in this month. And what I love about it is I can page forward to other months. So like right now, look at that, lion's mane, boom, right at the top. Um, I can start looking forward and seeing what's in January, December, you know, into May of next year. Uh, so yes, it, the seasonality is very important because that determines the weather conditions that are optimal for the mushroom to grow. What else we got? It always takes a minute for typing too, if it's anyone like myself. Yeah. <laughs> All good. Um, oh, you know what? I'm going to take a second. I, I brought all these books down here. I might as well show them off a little bit. Um, I do want to say there's a lot of great references uh, aside from just apps and online. Um, something I love keeping around is the L.L. Bean Game and Fish Cookbook. You can find this at like most bookstores. Um, 
well, I, I say most bookstores. I've found it at a lot of used bookstores. Um, I'm sure you can find it at the library or I a was library. Say, we do have books here at the library as well. <laughs> what? That's, ing- that's amazing. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. All my years I've been volunteering at libraries. I think I've only borrowed two whole books. Um, but this LL Bean cookbook is great. It's got a bunch of recipes for wild fish and game. Um, I highly recommend that. Uh, I would recommend as well, like basics of either foraging or again, if you're going to do hunting, the basics of butchering. Um, this helped me carve a deer because I wasn't going to do that from memory. And honestly, all the, all the YouTube videos on it aren't, I, I didn't like any of them. Uh, there's other ones here like Native Harvest, which is Indian, American Indian inspired, inspired recipes. So it gets into a bunch of other native plants that you can find um, and various recipes for them. Uh, I've actually found a lot of stuff out at the local Goodwill and other thrift stores, but yeah, there's like, you know, hunting whitetail successfully, or if you're like me, not hunting them. Um, several others here. There's a book that I was given as a gift, uh, which is just Midwest foraging. So it goes over a lot of the things you can forage. Uh, highly recommend that one. I like to use this when I'm out on, I like to call them non-mushroom hunts. Every time I take a non-mushroom hunt is when I find mushrooms. So I need to take those more often. And actually mean right. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's look at some <laughs> questions here. Questions. Yeah. So let's see. Autumnberry, invasive and delicious. Never tried it. I'm sure it's amazing. Um, is it illegal slash allowed to pick mushrooms from public land, e.g., UC Woods? You got to check the rules on that. So um, it depends. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a legal expert here. Uh, you will want to check with the park district and you know local authorities. It never hurts to ask. Uh, I mean, you're welcome to also run from the, what is that, the better to ask forgiveness than permission, but I wouldn't recommend it when the feds are involved. So when it comes to going from public lands, I'm blanking on what's the really beautiful trail that's maintained by the U of I that's not in town here. Allerton? Um, Allerton. Thank you. So Allerton, absolutely beautiful. And if you go out there, there's specifically signs that say, do not mushroom hunt. And that's because it's beautiful, well-preserved land, and they don't want people out there stomping around taking mushrooms. Also, I was under the impression that and some areas are for research purposes. So you'll find some parks that are specifically like, nope, this is dedicated to land for research. We don't want you messing around in here and picking mushrooms. But usually that stuff should be pretty well posted. Um, are there specific trees that the lion's mane grow on? So the answer to that is yes. Uh, I don't know that from memory, and the reason is because I try not to commit much from mushrooms to memory here. But per my Shroomify app, I, I promise I don't own stock in Shroomify. Well, I would if I could. Uh, it grows on wounds of hardwood trees and dead logs, particularly oak and beech. So, oak and beech trees. Uh, and Meadowbrook. And I, will, I yeah. don't, don't think I've been to Meadowbrook, but I wouldn't doubt that that's one of them. And I will say too, we've got uh, quite a few books um, for foraging and on mushrooms and Midwest specific as well. Um, and the ones I really wanted to pull to show off were some new ones that we just got in. Um, and of course, those were all checked out, which is a great thing. Um, <laughs> but then I couldn't show them off this evening. Um, let's see, another note. We got another question? Oh, I thought we did. Maybe not. Maybe it's just me scrolling. Sorry. Uh, Let's see. Uh, Something else that I kind of want to note is, again, going back to the getting permission or having places to hunt. um, A a big part of, in my mind, getting to know your lands and know nature is know the people who use it as well. So I, (laughs) I like to recommend using this opportunity to network. Um, if you're able to join some local groups or, you know, make friends in this area, it's, it's a good skill to have because they can introduce you to people who may let you forage on their property. Um, again, you may find a lot of useful information. It's, it's great to go out and forage with somebody who has a intimate knowledge of the land and of these mushrooms. Again, I, I stick to these very niche ones that are really, really good, but really, really, uh, like specific because they're very easy to identify. I don't have to, you know, there's no poisonous lookalikes to lion's mane. Now there's one that looks very similar, um, bear tooth or, ooh, 
ooh, this is another quick note I want to throw out. I'm using unscientific names. Shame on me. Um, yeah, you're, in theory, I should have been using scientific names this whole time. That's boring. And I mispronounced them a whole bunch. Like I said, this is very informal. When you look inside of books and apps and online, they will all use a scientific name. And it's important because ram's head could mean hen of the woods, or it could mean something that looks more like a ram's head, which in my mind is a, um, oh, I'm really bad with names lately. I'm sorry, lion's mane. They could, it could mean two completely different things. So the scientific name is very important when you're out hunting. Um, anyway, I just saw a question pop up. The book I had is Native Harvest, uh, American Indian Wild Foods and Recipes um, by E. Barry Kavash. There's also, I do have a couple other ones here. Um, there's one more I saw. I cannot attest to this one. I have not read it. It was gifted to me by a friend, um, but it's exploring the outdoors with Indian secrets. I assume they mean Native Americans. I don't imagine that they're exploring the U.S. outdoors with anything from the Indian subcontinent, but nevertheless, um, yeah, that's another available book. And again, the kind of the world is your oyster, or at least the library is. Um, you know, you can find tons of books at the library. You can find tons of resources online. There's a lot of great videos online you can look up. Uh, there's just, you know, opportunity after opportunity out there to learn about some of this stuff. But again, please, 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 I opened with this. I want to close with this or close close-ish to it. Um, make sure that you're being safe. You are, you are the only thing it can prevent you from putting a poisonous mushroom in your mouth. Unless someone is really sadistic and trying to force feed you it, which I really doubt they will. Um, and when I to see go, this I, note about the Facebook group too, I mean, that's, a, that's a, like you said, that's another great way to meet up and network with other people. I was yes. going to suggest, um, I admit that I'm, I'm on TikTok and uh, there's some really great foragers on, on TikTok and some, uh, local, not local, but like Ohio regional uh, places as well. So again, going back to, you know, make sure you know what you're, you're collecting and eating, but uh, there is great information out there in a variety of ways. Yeah. Um, to, to add to that with the um, Facebook groups and whatnot, there are several groups out there for mushroom identification. Please, uh, you know, be, I'm going to say be wary of those and use those with, um, I'm going to say great, what is it? Great power comes great responsibility. There is a lot of power in using a network of people. Don't abuse it. Don't pop on there with just any random mushroom you find and say, hey, is this edible? Because there's, it's almost disheartening every time someone just sends me a photo and says, hey, is this edible? It's like, I, I don't know. <laughs> you, you sent me a grainy photo that looks like it was taken on a literal razor, not just the old cell phone razor. And I, I can't confirm or deny if you give me more information, I might be able to narrow it down. But what that tells me is you're not concerned about actually identifying a mushroom and learning. You're just curious if you can throw this thing in soup or not. So uh, again, it kind of goes back to the, why are you actually doing any of this? And you know, the, the other important thing is don't necessarily rely off of a friend. Um, I, I won't ever tell anybody that uh, a <laughs> mushroom is edible or not because I don't want them to trust me. I, I barely trust me. I, I can't even trust that I'm getting to the store the right way half the time. I, how, how do you expect me to prove that a mushroom is edible? And the answer is through three different sources. So anyway. Uh, education and, and educating yourself on this. I mean, it, you don't want to take a risk like that. So I think that's important. Yeah. Well, we are coming up on close to the hour. Bly, I just want to say thank you. Um, a fabulous presentation, um, great information and resources. So anyway, thank you all for joining tonight and um, have a great event or a great evening. Thank you so much.